Okay, so it is week 11. This is our first class. Today we'll be talking primarily about search engine optimization and the extension and or purpose of that uh, as we discuss social media optimization and social publishing. So in content, you're going to see a few more links populate here uh, for tomorrow, but this is mostly what we'll be focusing on today. And we started talking about this, what, back in week three, I think, when we were talking about the web workshop. And I've, up to this point, mainly focused on the fact that SEO includes a lot of content related to keywords. Keyword phrases, the, the, the combination of words that you can put together that will link up with the types of phrases that users are searching for when it relates to the content on your website. And we also spent some time talking about the SERP. Now, do you remember what that stands for? SERP is an acronym for what? And Megan would be very upset if you could answer this question. SERP. So people are rumbling, and I can hear you guys saying it. Okay, good. I'm adding that. All right, so search engine results page. And on the search engine results page, if we were to search something like this, for example, You don't see any uh, types of links coming up across the top or around the right side. What do we call those? Call, sorry, called. What do we call those? Sponsored, paid, paid advertising. Okay, this is what we consider more of a reputational type of thing. It's more earned with the search engines based on how you rank, and your ranking is based primarily on content. Now, there's a lot of other things that come into play here when we're talking about search engine optimization, but your main focus with SEO is to get your website to rank as best as you possibly can in the organic listings. So when you search using a search engine like Google, you're going to find that it's not that easy to get your website to rank at the top. I'm specifically choosing a category that I know doesn't have a lot of competition. It's, it's fairly specific because as soon as I add a town in there that doesn't have a lot of business or commerce going on, to search for the phrase surf shop, this website that I made is gonna come up first, not just because I've done a good job with the keyword placement, and making sure that the keywords are included everywhere they need to be, not overdoing it, making sure there's unique inclusions of keywords. There's only one legitimate surf shop in Grand Bend. There's another business with the surf shop in the name, but it's more of just a soft goods store. And this comes up in the Google listings here, and it does come up as the second organic listing. Um, but mine comes up first because of the keywords. Now, when I go in here, you're going to see that there's a bit of a blog role set up uh, this is not a WordPress site, it's being converted to a WordPress site, but this is a Java tool that we use for blogging so that you can create unique instances of keywords. This here, even though it may not look like it, is considered an actual heading. Now one of the problems with the content here is the fact that there's a bunch of heading twos and then content that follows, and search engines are only going to look, I think it's, it's changing on almost like a monthly basis, but I think they're only looking now at the first six sentences within a given heading in the content of a page. So if you make the same heading over and over, even if it's different words in there, um, you're going to run into something that, that makes a lot of your content, it's not useless, it's far from useless. It's just as soon as you get past the point where you've used heading one more than once, it downgrades that content in terms of its role or its importance in the ranking that the search engine is going to give it. It downgrades that dramatically. So I'm, I'm giving you an example of a search for something that is very specific and it's not that complicated in your role as a search engine optimizer to get that to come up at the top. Take a pick. Give me something else. What could I search that would be far from this, that would be nothing like this? Anybody in here bought a car recently? This is a good one. Okay, used cars. How about used cars London? We'll make it a little more specific than that. Used cars Ontario would be way, way too broad. 
Um, used cars, London, Ontario. What do we get? Well, right off the top, on the SERP, we see numerous listings that are coming up along the right side here. We also see, uh, actually, they didn't, they didn't give us any top, um, top sponsored links. Usually they do. It, it, can, it can even change uh, according to the time of day. Um, so these listings here are still in the organic section. In, unless you would see a line, uh, most of the search engines will offer you top sponsored links and then uh, more sponsored links across the right side. Actually, Bing, Bing does it that way. So if I were to search used cars, London, Ontario, Bing. And it, probably one of the reasons that that didn't give me sponsored links that were placing a higher bid, which means they're going to come up over top of the organic listings, you have to bid more for that. I, I know that in your uh, GA course, in your Google Analytics course, Megan may not have gotten into this very much, but you do have your search, and, search engine marketing course coming up next semester, and you're going to learn how to get your listings to come up uh, along the right side and along the top. So again, it's a little weird. Maybe it's the time of, uh, the time of day, but usually you would get a collection of sponsored links that come across the top, too, and there's a little bit of a, a horizontal line. Looks like an HTML horizontal line. You have a market here that's much more competitive. Various businesses are bidding on keywords, and they're probably bidding like well within the dollar range that come up as a sponsored link here. Now, that business doesn't pay Bing or Yahoo or Google. These are the three main platforms for search engine marketing. You pay per click. You put together campaigns and you pay per click. That is something you're going to learn. There's an entire course on that. That's going to happen next semester. We're still focusing on how to best get your site to rank in the organic section when you search for a business or a topic or a theme or a type of blog or some, uh, some type of instructional thing that you're trying to push and it's connected to a YouTube channel. Now, mentioning YouTube is opening the door into a whole other area where you can start to optimize your traffic, but it's done with social media platforms. So SEO and SMO are not the same things. They are two very different things because while they are somewhat connected to each other because you need a well-optimized presence, typically started via your main, your main headquarters, your main hub on the web would be a website. And the, these websites are gradually um, playing less of a role in a business's uh, web presence overall because usually nowadays they're just portals to other places where you're promoting these ideas, these topics, these products, these services in social media platforms. And that is more about a presence. It's more about awareness and sentiment. So social media optimization is more about publicity where search engine optimization is more about methodology. There are actually specific things that you can do, a, a list, long list of things you can do to make this happen. So in week 11, I've provided you with some links, okay? The first one is an actual definition, and Webopedia is my favorite place to go for definitions that are web-related, and it uses the same word I did, and which I love, because this is a, a great word to describe what's happening when you're optimizing your web presence specific to a website. It's a methodology, which, mean, which means it's a collection of tasks. It's a series of things that you're doing. In week three, we talked about keywords, right? Don't add an image to your website without describing to the browser, to the search engine, sorry, and to the browser, because the browser, actually, that's not incorrect to say that. The browser needs to interpret the information coming from your website so that the search engine can actually read it and apply a rank to it. So there, there are a number of things going on. Um, here, just go back to the basic color scheme. There are a number of things going on when you perform a search. And one of the main things is that the search engine is looking for keyword phrases that match up with the phrase that the user has searched for. So the methodology of strategies would include keywords placed in all these different locations. And you want it to be placed so that the keywords do not seem as if they are repeating. Repeating keywords over and over again will actually harm your rank. Okay, so in addition to how much time users spend on your page, how many pages deep they will go into a website, if they will go to links from your page 
that are still connected to your business in some way, and search engines do know that. They can easily figure that out based on more page information from the next place they go. Reciprocal links from other businesses or, or websites talking about these things, blogging about these things, that go back to your site, and then your site goes back to there. All of these things play a role in your ranking in addition to simply adding the keywords in there. So to completely focus on keywords is not the right way to do it, but that is going to be your main focus. You just you have to remember that there are a lot of other things at play, so to just sit there and try and start jamming keywords everywhere you can in your content is not necessarily going to help. In fact, it could hurt you. The reason it could hurt you is because search engines now, for well over 10 years now, have been able to very easily figure out when you're repeating content, when there aren't unique instances of content. What I mean by that is you don't deliberately go into paragraphs after paragraphs in a page and just start repeating the same keyword phrase over and over again just to make sure that the search engines are aware that you're discussing this on that page. You'd be better off actually making multiple pages. So something like this that I've shown you, and I understand I'm your instructor, but I teach this stuff. It's hard to find the time to actually make a lot of this stuff for clients. Okay, but when I show you this, there are fundamental issues here. Okay, the content that you see down here and the, all of these graphics have keywords associated with them that describe exactly what the user is going to find. Behind that link, I have like a monthly photo thing, but a lot of the keyword phrases that are important for a website like this are repeated in these blog posts with the same heading. This is why a WordPress site is so much more powerful because it automatically sets up a post as a different and separate piece of content in your site that most search engines, unless they're doing things in, in a different way that I'm still learning about, it, they search these as separate pieces of content. Where in a basic HTML site, it will search all of this as one page, including my Java scroller here, that provides a bit of a window that then doesn't take up the entire page, so you don't have to scroll through all this content, but it's still, you're putting everything in the same page. There is still a professor, there was, according to a student of mine that came from Western, and they'd taken a web design course as an elective. This was just over two years ago. This professor was still teaching as, as a best practice for search engine optimization to go down, once you finish creating the page, go down into the bottom, create a bunch of text that matches the color of this background down here, and just keep typing those special keyword phrases that you want users to connect to your site, like hyperlight wakeboards. Okay, wakeboarding lessons, Grand Bend. Grand Bend Beach, you could stand up paddleboard rental and type it like a hundred times and then paste it another hundred times. Just keep jamming it down there in the footer so nobody can really see it, but the search engines know it's there. Do you guys actually think that works now? Good, you're shaking your heads because you know this. You, you, you probably know from Megan's course that this kind of stuff will, I mean, it won't just negatively affect your ranking. It will destroy your rank to do that kind of stuff. Because what's happening here is that search engines and the companies behind these, these uh, programs, because they are programs, they have algorithms that are extremely advanced and they can see that stuff. They've been seeing that stuff for 15 years. Yet for some reason, there's still a professor that is teaching this as a best practice. I, I think this person might need to update their skills a little bit. I have no idea who it is. I'm not trying to slander somebody from another school. I'm just saying this is an example of not updating yourself with the types of practices and strategies that you need to do to be a good optimizer. So it is all about keywords, but it's not just about repeating them everywhere you can. Okay, there are specific lengths that are appropriate for the type of, like there's your meta description, there's your meta keywords, there are title tags for links, there's alternative keywords for images, and there's also alternative keywords for anchors if you start to create places in pages where you can go to. So a link can go to a place in a page instead of another location, which is not something I teach because search engines would rather see separate pages. They'd rather see less content on more pages than piles of content on one page because they're, not gonna, they're only going to look so far before they consider the remaining content not as important or not as pertinent to the page. 
So we know what search engine optimization is. That was probably a much, um, a much more involved definition than I first gave you when we talked about it when we were doing the web workshop. But this is the primary focus as, as we start to wrap this course up. You don't just want to make a website, you want to make it work. And that's what SEO is all about. People say this is the free version of getting your website you know, advertised or better. I mean, technically it's not advertising if you're not paying for it, but getting to rank better with the search engines. I mean, you guys know by now, after spending just a little bit of time on your websites, nothing is free. Because time costs money, especially when you're working for a business or working for yourself. And search engine optimization as a practice, as a methodology of strategies, as Webopedia calls it, takes a lot of time. You can crank out a WordPress site in a day. Like if you take a whole day, you can make it really good looking too. You can really set this thing up. But you're gonna to see tomorrow when I install the plugin that I wanna recommend that you guys use. And if you've already started working with the all-in-one SEO plugin, that's fine. But tomorrow I'm gonna to help you uh, with another plugin called WordPress SEO by Yoast. And this one allows you to optimize every single item in a WordPress site, including your categories, which technically aren't even surface elements, like a page or a post. You can optimize your categories. And they give you multiple fields to optimize these, and they recommend certain lengths and all that stuff. And it's done through this plugin that does add quite a bit of extra time every time you create a piece of content. This is where a large part of your mark will be coming from in the final project. And I'm going over that again tomorrow too. Now that you're done with your project plans, I'm gonna go back through the specs. Um, so let's talk about some of the things that you could do. Okay, we know about keywords, but in week 11 I've given you a couple lists. Okay, the first one includes 95 items. This is about five or six years old, but they, I've noticed that they continue to update it. And even a list that's you know, this is getting a bit dated at this point. I still have yet to find one this uh, extensive and concise. There's a ton, and a ton of stuff out there. Tons of videos that try and explain how to do this. The majority of them are, are pitching their company's services for search engine optimization. Uh, this particular list is more of an about thing, and I really like where it starts. I mean, right off the top, it starts talking about those headings and how important it is to actually use the hierarchy when you're including headings in a page if you insist on actually including that much content. Nowadays, you shouldn't, if you're gonna have post after post after post after post, that's great, and each of them will be their own piece of content associated with a category with their own title and their own general topic or theme for that post that should relate back to the main topic for your website. HTML sites still, I still find that users sort of get into this rut where they're just, they're in a rush, they don't want to crank out another page even though they could just copy that page and just change the, change the, the, the main frame content in the main div there. They, they just keep going on and on about stuff, right? This is not good, but if you insist on doing this, you should use proper HTML headings. And even in the WYSIWYG format, when you're creating a poster page in, in uh, WordPress, you can choose which headings you want to use. So if you've used a heading one, for example, and you're going to have more content in there, it should connect back to that topic, like an outline. Like we learned to outline with Roman numerals in elementary school. It should connect back to that topic, and you should start with heading two. And if you, if you want to have more, you should go to heading three. Sorry, start with one, go to heading two, then go to heading three. And once you run out of headings, you've already made the page way too long. Okay, search engines don't want to go digging at what don't want to. It's not, about, it's not about aspirations or desire. It's about a mathematical, uh, a, a series of mathematical equations that we're never going to get to see or really even understand. I mean, if you're, if you're in the business of writing up that kind of code and creating algorithms like that, you're probably in the wrong program. You should probably already be working for Google. So, I mean, this is complicated stuff. And a list like this tells you how to work in harmony with these search engines. Use your keyword phrase in, anchor link, in the anchor text of links. A lot of people call this anchor text. I call it title text. So as I taught you in the web workshop, when you create a link, don't just make the link because you can tell people more about the link than just the link text. Okay, but the link text is the anchor text of the link that they're referring to where you're not typically gonna link 
in the surface of a page to an HTTP address. You're going to link to a little phrase of keywords. This phrase should include relevant keywords to your content. Behind that, you can use what's called the link title to actually extend that phrase a little bit and give users a bit more information about it. You don't want to go too far because there are appropriate links. And that's the cool thing about these plugins is that they're always changing the length of approximately what it should be. But when you have a plugin, it'll tell you when you've gone too far. It'll say, yeah, there's no point putting any more in here because the search engine doesn't care. You've gone too far. Okay, um, keyword phrase inside incoming links. Okay, incoming links. Inbound links are a great way to improve your page rank, but you can't really control how people link to your pages. Chances are they won't use a phrase that you like. They say you can't really control this, but if somebody's linked to you, you probably know about it. I mean, the days of just everyone linking to each other randomly for no reason whatsoever are kind of gone now. When I was in a band, we used to link to every band we ever played with. And this would be a, a page called Friend, as if that was relevant to the people that were on our site and might be interested in hearing music from other bands that sounded like us or we were very close to. So as I learned more about the process of optimizing a site, I changed this page and I changed like our, it was like a friends page, right? Like our, our friends in the industry kind of thing. And it only had about 10 or 12 bands on it because those were the, the only bands that were really relevant to what we were doing. And, and then I, I had control over them linking back to us too because I don't have this list of like thousands of people, hundreds of people. And you could directly communicate with them and try and get them to put a keyword phrase into the anchor text that actually is relevant to what you're doing. Try and get links from reputable sites. Uh, try to get links from similar sites. Try to get links from edu and .gov sites. This is a really good one. Um, have you guys clicked on something? Like if you're, you're painting your house maybe. Probably not, you guys don't own houses. Let's say that you're getting something for one of your pets, you're, you're getting some work done for one of your cats, okay? And you're on the veterinarian's website and they link to a specific kind of cat food that they recommend to be very healthy for your cat. Would you think that would be a good food to buy, honestly? Like if your veterinarian is linking to it, does that sound good to you? Yes? Okay. Why? Because she's a veterinarian. She must know what the hell she's talking about. Right? There's guys, I, I know I know it's eight in the morning, sorry, but it is this is really important. Okay, you you know how to make a website better. The process of getting your website to mean something to people is a lot harder than making the website. You could spend a year doing this and fail and fail and fail. It's a very complicated process, okay? It seems simple, but it isn't because to find that groove, to find, to find you know, the, the, just the, the right zone to be in, it's tough, especially when you're in a competitive market. So a lot of you aren't dealing directly with products and services. Some of you are doing a personal portfolio site. Some of you are writing a blog about something you're passionate about. It's, it's, it still falls into the same category. It's hard to make this relevant to users when there's a bunch of other stuff out there that's exactly like it. So to have a link, let's say that you do have pets and you've started a grooming service that has been known to be the most gentle and pet friendly and just really, really good. And cats come out of there even happier than when they went in, which is very unusual for a cat because cats are, they got a lot of attitude. They're, they're mostly a pain in the butt and you know, they're not going to like it when you take them to be groomed somewhere. So this is a pretty big deal. And you're doing fairly well in London and stuff's going on and whatever. And all of a sudden you realize that there's another person doing the same thing as you and they're kind of copying the stuff you're doing and they're, they're sort of almost emulating your whole business model and they're getting customers too. Because when people are Googling, Googling you, you're both sort of coming up with the same type of rank and you're both getting like an equal share of the organic page. What if on top of that, two of the biggest veterinarian uh, vet hospitals in London or whatever hospitals, they're not all hospitals, but locations, link directly to you. 
you know, and they're advocating your business. This stuff makes a difference. Links are a big, huge deal. Links are as important as the content that the people are going to find after they click on the link. I mean, it all starts with content, but links are big, big, big. It, I did um, some environmental impact studies on my property recently, and for certain, if I would have seen the government recommending a specific science, they're, called, they're, they're environmental engineering firms, they're engineering firms that do this. There aren't that many in this part of Ontario, there aren't that many on the Ontario period that will come out to your property that have qualified scientists, they're, they're environmental biologists that will come and test your property for the potential impact I might have on a series of endangered species. So this is all very complicated and government websites cannot play the SEO game as much as a, a site that's marketing a product or a service. Government websites are providing information to citizens, to residents of a local municipality, whatever it may be, and this information needs to remain static to some degree, more so than a standard website. You can't be changing around like the tax structures and changing around all the information about how a municipality runs its services and changing around, for example, the requirements that I have to conduct impact studies on this vacant land that I bought. You can't just change that every week. And, and changing content often and frequently is also a good way to optimize a site because your search engines not only look at content, look at links, look how long people stay there, look where they went afterwards, look how many pages deep they went. All these things play a role. They also look at how recently was your site updated? Has it received any updates that were relevant to the keyword phrase of this user searching? With WordPress, it's great because you can have static pages, but continue to update via posts. And you don't have to be a blogger just to use posts. Posts can be news. It can be something about something new that came into your store. When I was on this government website, I'm sitting there reading about this stuff, knowing this is really important. Like, I have to do this, or I'm not going to be allowed to build anything or put a road in front of these lots. If that site in that section where it describes what I need to do linked directly to their recommended business, because, of course, the federal government, um, and these are the feds. I mean, there's a, there's a Ministry of Natural Resources in each province, but this is a mandate from the federal government. I mean, the, the MNR everywhere is pretty much federal level. They are telling me what to do. They're telling me I have to go and do these studies, but they aren't going to do it for me. I have to pay for them privately. So there are private businesses that do this. And if they recommended one in a government site, you better believe that I would have probably clicked on that link and I might not even have shopped around. So maybe it's not a good thing, but for the business that would have been recommended or received that link, it would have been good. Because I did shop around and the price ranged from 10 grand to 1800 bucks. And it's not like I was automatically gonna choose the firm that was 1800 bucks, but oddly enough, even though they were the cheapest, they were the most informative, sorry, they made the, the whole process easier to understand. And I did find them through a Google search. Okay, Google searched environmental engineering and about 10 things came up for Ontario. And I called, I called them and only three of them did this. And it was the one, and you know, had they not come up on the first uh, page, the organic listings, I probably never even would have called them. So that in itself uh, demonstrates that their site was reasonably well optimized. But if they'd had a link to a government site, like all of this stuff on the first page, half of it is about links. Okay, then it goes on about content. Create as much content as you can, but don't have it all in one place. Keep your content inside one theme. Don't, don't start going on about my friend that had the mobile pressure business. On the front page of his site, when he first launched it, he, I taught him how to update it, and he went and put all this stuff on there about kiteboarding. On the same page where he's defining his business, his landing page, and talking to his his users about what he does and what he offers. He's got information about kiteboarding that has nothing to do with what he does as a business. So he was getting a lot of traffic likely because he put that stuff there and it was useless traffic. And these people weren't going any further into the page which hurts his rank, right? If you bounce right off the page, that's part of your bounce rate. It does a certain amount of time that they're gonna be on there for before they leave and that's, that's not a good thing. Um, keep your site live as long as possible. 
older pages at the same domain will rank higher than new ones. Now, I know I keep going on about creating new content, but that would be new pieces of content within your site. If you have a page that's been around for years that continues to see a lot of traffic, that's really good. So I'm going to jump around here because there are 10 full pages of stuff about this. Um, still in the medium priority level here, create a site map. There's a lot of stuff you can do off-site. You can create a site map and submit this to Google and Yahoo and Bing. You can set up Google Webmaster tools. Webmaster is like your main hub where you would connect like your AdWords. You can connect your YouTube account, which is owned by Google, of course. You can connect Google Analytics, AdSense, all these different programs that Google offers. They can all be run within the Google Web, well, run. They're all kind of connected to the Google Webmaster platform. And by using Webmaster, which is another thing I'm going to get into before the end of the course. I'm just going to give you a, like, like a really brief crash course on Webmaster. It just makes it easier to have all that stuff organized. And it also suggests to you things you can do in different parts of your site. You know, your analytics is saying that these pages are working quite well, but you're not really using them in any of your AdWords campaigns. This is kind of a big deal. You should take advantage of that. Right, that's, that's the cool thing about having Webmaster. They also have very useful tools like the Keyword Planner. Right, Google has a Keyword Planner. I think Bing and Yahoo have something quite similar where you can actually input keyword phrases or just single words to test the viability of that phrase. It'll tell you how many people search for this each month in a given area. Like really cool stuff. So there's a lot of things you can do to actually test what you're going to be using to optimize your site to see if it's going to work. Creating the site map and sending those to these different search engines helps them understand the entire makeup of your site and where everything is. Um, not having your site, there's a, there's a big thing going on now, and this is kind of recent in the last five or six years. Uh, www.something.com is not the same as just something.com. And if you don't tell the search engines what you have set to be your permanent redirect, it, it, it thinks you're trying to market the same content with two different domains, which is not, it's not the same as you actually having a bunch of domains going to the same exact content in a bunch of different folders. That's really bad. Okay, you're still allowed to forward domains as long as they're all going to the same folder. That's not really going to hurt your rank. But if you have what's called a canonical, which is something I'm going to talk about when I talk about webmaster tools, this is, a lot of this stuff is kind of beyond this course because you could have an entire second course just on properly optimizing the site once you build it. I'm just sort of getting you guys started here. So you don't want to, you want to have a, a, a permanent redirect and you want to have all of them always go to that address. So you're not like mixing and matching. Excluding the triple W it do, is actually considered a different domain by search engines, which is kind of surprising. Um, so it talks more about redirects. It talks more about links again. Um, get your keyword phrase in the first paragraph. It's usually once you get past the first paragraph, the search engines already stop looking. Put your keyword phrase in alternative text. That's an obvious one. We talked a lot about that when we were doing the web workshop. Um, make your keyword phrase stand out. It does make a difference if the person can see it right away visually. This is something that's very difficult for search engines to really apply to a rank because that's more based on if the person went there and the keywords were there, it's already established that you would rank well because they were there. How long did they stay there? That will give you a better rank. If you make it visually more obvious where your keywords are, they might notice it and then not bounce off so quickly. So it's, it's, I don't see that in a lot of lists. Like that's pretty cool. That's why I like this big list. I know there's a lot of stuff. Let's jump right to the end here. So I'm not gonna go through obviously all 95 of these things in class today. Um, never redirect another domain uh, to yours, okay? Because this, this can actually get you banned, like it, where you're, you're just harvesting domains and just sending them to your sites. Um, redirecting another domain is 100% guaranteed that you'll be banned from search engines. Um, there's also kind of a spammy way to do this. You can, with, uh, with search engine marketing and with the keywords that you can put into your, your page titles and other places in your pages, you can make it seem as if you have the domain people are searching for and then direct it to your site. Um, there are also ways you can get, you can like, uh, you can hijack a domain. I mean, obviously if you're a spammer, you're gonna get 
bands. So there's a lot of stuff on this last page that I kind of like because it's, um, it's telling you things not to do, which a lot of lists don't do either. And this one I really like. A lot of times people now, as soon as they figured out that you can't just repeat content like that professor at Western is telling you to do, you can't just go over and over. Hyperlink, wait for us, hyperlink, wait for us, hyperlink, wait for us. It's not going to do well in the search engine. But if you had a picture of some of these wait for us, after you've mentioned it a couple times in a paragraph, you could then use the alternative keywords to have another unique instance of those words. And it would be considered unique. But then people started putting invisible images up just so they could have another place to put keywords that wouldn't be considered uh, duplicate, right? Repeating. And of course, search engines are so incredibly smart that they figured this out and said, yep, yeah, yeah, that's going to hurt your rank. Yeah, we can see that picture is not actually a picture. It doesn't exist. And you know, obviously, as I've explained, you can't, a search engine can't read a picture. So it's not going to know if there's pixels there, but it's going to know somehow if that picture had, it's identical or matches the background, or if there's actually no image content in there, or if it says image coming soon, and it gets this stuff. I don't know how. I mean, most of us will never understand these algorithms, but it does. Um, and then there's my favorite one, you know, that everybody's known not to do for like 15 years, but you know, they still have to put it in this list because there are still professors at established universities teaching this stuff. And I'm not saying anything negative about Western. I mean, I'm sure Western's great, but the program you're in now is just as competitive as anything you might have there. So, especially when there's teachers teaching this. Um, here is a, a list that you might be able to better apply to your project keeping in mind that some of the off-site stuff is not going to be as easy to do if you're not launching a site, nor can I grade you on that, okay? But the on-site stuff, I can. Okay, so this is much shorter. And this is a company that's trying to market this stuff. This is an older page. I just think it's a nice, simple list. Um, now that you're working with WordPress sites, you can easily set up a feed. People can just subscribe to your blog so they know when you update or send something new. But all of this stuff, I mean, you've known how to do this pretty much since the web workshop. Redirects are just hyperlinks. Anchor text is your link text, okay? You can also do title text. You, of course, have the title in your page, which is one of the most important places for your keywords because it describes the page. Very rarely do you ever see a page come up in a search now in the organic listings where the title says untitled document. Not simply because the search engines refuse to rank those well, but because there are so few pages that actually do that nowadays. Okay, the meta description allows you to provide the user with a bit more information. I don't know why. I've, I've seen blog posts and I've seen stuff in YouTube videos that say this doesn't matter anymore. Like BS, it totally still matters. It just doesn't play as much of a role as the title of the page does. It still matters. Okay, so the meta description, like the meta keywords, would go into the code. The user would never see it on the surface of the page, but it's a place where you can put like several sentences, actually. And then the keywords within a certain length, and your plugin will tell you if you've gone too far, you can do a phrase or a single word. Typically, they're phrases because single words are too broad based. And comma, the next phrase, comma, the next phrase. And you don't just start jamming stuff in there just because you think it might get somebody to your page. It should be relevant to the content that's truly on the page. And if you don't do it that way, you're going to get less traffic. Okay, people think they're going to get more traffic by jamming all these keywords in there. Okay, then you have the headings, you have the alt tags. So always check for stuff like this, broken links. Make sure your code is compatible with W3C. This is real easy. That's why I keep telling you to get more browsers. Just test your WordPress site in at least three browsers. If it works across three browsers, you've kind of eliminated the odds of it not working in more than that. Okay, which is what it says here. So this one sort of takes care of that one. And then there's this big list of stuff that you can do once you launch your site, which is, has nothing really to do with the site itself. This plugin that I'm going to show you to use, this Yoast plugin tomorrow, it actually will make one of those XML site maps for you. And if you Google it, there's lots of sites that will make them for you. And you just, you have your, you put in your domain, you submit your site, and it creates an XML site map. XML is done in, in cells, it's done in tables like a cell. Okay, it's a 
a spreadsheet format of, of data, the same way your database is set up, and it tells the search engines what's going on in your site and how it's all laid out, right? Which is cool because it makes it easier for them to rank you if they know what's in your entire site when they're sending people to a specific page. Okay, I, I rarely do this for people that I crank out websites for because it's mostly my friends and I just don't have time to do this extra stuff. You're done with your website. It is completely done. And there's all this stuff you can do and this is a short list. It's, that, that's cute that they put Alexa in there as if, as if anything really matters beyond Google, Yahoo, and Bing. I mean, it's, once you got those ones done, you're pretty much covered. But in my class, I am not marking you for this. I can't mark you for this because I'm not requiring you guys to all go live. And in order to do this, you'd have to be live. All right, but the plugin that I'm gonna have you use will create the sitemap for you. And when I show you Google Webmaster Tools, it will give you an idea of how this works across all three of those major search engines, okay? So this is a nice uh, list. It's, it's a little more stripped down and simple. I wanna go back to this top thing. Okay, this is pretty important, and then we're going to get into this SMO and social publishing thing. Uh, URL, which stands for what? Uniform Resource Locator. Okay, that's not the same as a domain. A domain is the something.com, something.ca, the actual name part of it. The URL is the entire address. They recommend here to focus on these URLs as another place to put keywords. Okay, so tomorrow when I go into your WordPress sites, I'm gonna show you that in your permalinks, and we haven't really played around with this a lot, but in settings and permalinks, every theme defaults to show you just the page numbered ID in the, in the address bar of the browser. So ID number six, page seven, with a question mark, and there's all these weird characters in there. This is not optimized. What's more optimized is something, here's another cheesy site that I made, okay? this. This one is uh, one that I made for my dad's band, um, The Magic Moments. Okay, once people are there, they're likely going to understand that it's a cover band. I, you know, ideally, to put the word music right into the domain, to add some type of keyword phrasing in the domain that better describes what's on the site is good. That's a good thing. Okay, if you have something like this where it's the name of a band, it's getting fairly obvious, but if you go to recordings, for example, instead of just naming the page recordings.html, I named it listen to the magic moments.html. So in the URL, I'm actually providing more keywords so that people know they can hear the band here. Listen to the magic moments is telling them a lot more than recordings. That could be any number of things. I mean. That could be like recordings of like geothermal activity under, under like a volcano. Like it, it doesn't tell the user anything about what's really on the page. When you, when you see the phrase, listen to the magic moments, most people are gonna actually assume, oh, it's probably a, a band. It sounds like a cover band, right? I'm trying to lead people to that without overdoing it in there, obviously. So don't just make a page called about. Make the page called about and then name your business right after it. Why wouldn't you do that, right? You're not gonna get flagged for having like a few extra characters in your URL. So this is the URL. Whatever domain you choose to use, there is a lot to be said for a domain that's also easier to remember because there's nothing wrong with direct traffic, right? And that's, that's another part of optimization that nobody ever talks about is how much time you should spend picking a domain. It's really important. Okay, so once you get past that, you have this URL that you can start to add words to. In your permalinks, you would change the settings in your WordPress site to go from, um, here, I might as well show you quickly. Um, you would change it to go from the page ID, which is the standard way to do permalinks, my ZAMP is off again, um, to post name. Okay, has anybody had their ZAMP like having to reinstall every time you restart your computer. Somebody said, somebody in the other section said, oh yeah, my ZAMP makes me, like reinstalling it takes like 10 minutes. I don't, I mean, mine stops every time I restart my computer, which I want it to do because I, it, it does run, it does take up RAM when it's running if you're not using it. But you guys shouldn't have to reinstall it. You should just have to go back and turn on the services. Nobody in here is having to reinstall the entire program, right? Okay, good. 
Um, so my Zampson, I'm going to go to the site that I've been playing around with here. Okay, so I've changed the demo site since I, I had you guys start your final project. So in order to do this, I have to log in. I mean, everything I'm talking about, you got to do in the dashboard. So from here in the dashboard, if you go to settings, and then you go to permalinks, you can see in the other section, I already changed this. This is your default. So this, you'll have a domain here if you actually get this hosted, right? You won't have just your local address. And this here doesn't tell the user anything. Like, this is garbage, okay? That's very poorly optimized. If you go to post name, it will accept what's called the slug as your name. So if I change that setting and go save, and then I go to like a post, for example. So I was doing this in the other class. I'll do this again tomorrow too, because I'm going to show you the SEO plugin and how everything works. But every post or page you make, it gives you the opportunity to include what's called a slug. I've mentioned this very briefly in all my sections, but because we didn't get to the full WordPress SEO lecture yet, I hadn't really talked about it. So you might have to go into your screen options. And remember that you have screen options that change as you go to different places in your dashboard. You might have to go into your screen options and actually set it so that the slug is showing. And once you do that, you'll have what's called a slug down here. So this was a post I made about stand-up paddle boards. And I made a really simple slug called 2015 Sucks, because people will search that. People, everyone knows that's in the stand-up paddle, okay? Not necessarily people that are, are new to the industry, but people that are going to be looking for board reviews, even people that are new will quickly realize that the acronym for stand-up paddle is just as generally accepted as stand-up paddle. So I put into my slug 2015 subs, and then when I go, um, it was already updated, but whatever. When I go and view the post, and this is going to be hard for you guys to see because you're so far away in this classroom. See this? That is optimized. Page ID number six question mark equals a bunch of bullshit is not optimized. Everywhere you can put freaking keywords, you need to put them. This takes forever. Building the website is easy. Making it work, making it rank well in the organic listings is not so easy. That is search engine optimization. Okay, now, um, I, did, I did have one more link in there. Uh, if we go to week 11, this is kind of cool too, and I'll add some more stuff for tomorrow as well that relates to SE, SMO and social publishing. So this is a bit of an older article. This is almost five years old now. And I still think it's really relevant. I still have yet to find stuff that's, that's this specifically tailored to what I'm trying to explain to you guys. The Amazon shopping experience, over time, since 1995, they've been around now. I bet they're going to have some major sales next year for the 20-year anniversary. It's going to be awesome. I love Amazon. I'm a huge Amazon fan. I think Black Friday and, and whatever, Boxing Day, I think it's a total freaking scam. If you guys look on Amazon, Anytime surrounding these days, you can usually get stuff as cheap, if not cheaper, than if you're going to go into these stores. Now, I know there are some, they're trying to compete with these online realtors, not the realtors. Retailers now, and they're getting into these, these like early morning sales and get, be the first 20 through the door and you'll get this amazing deal, but you're still not saving that much compared to the deals you get every day on Amazon. I mean, it's really cool. So, needless to say, this blew up, became a huge retailer. They started to change the experience based on the way the industry had evolved because the consumer is expecting to be more engaged, they're expecting to participate. The consumer has become part of the narrative in terms of the marketing. Okay, because of that, the Amazon experience changed with it. And it talks about the way everything is served up. I mean, these guys, they didn't really start it, but in terms of behavioral retargeting, like serving up ads for products that match what you've just been looking for based on your cookies, these guys are the pros. It's just amazing how well they do this. And I, I find myself, I don't, I don't buy into this crap in, in most social platforms that I'm in, and I, I don't necessarily consider Amazon a social platform. Although because of the, because of the, the quality of the, the review platform that they have built into their store, it, it kind of is a social platform. Um, I respond quite well to the behavioral retargeting because it's, it matches up so well with what I'm searching for. Like I was looking for a toilet last year when I was renovating this house, my house. 
and uh, ended up buying a completely different toilet that I spent 15 minutes picking out because as soon as I finally picked it out, something popped up right below it that looked so similar and it was so much cheaper and I clicked on it and it was, uh, it was um, an open box version of the same toilet. And I never would have known if it wasn't for the behavioral retargeting. Behavioral retargeting is serving up ads based on your activities. Some people think this is unethical, like whatever. Like welcome to, to the web, I mean, come on. So that's another link I'd like you to take a look at. As always, I don't necessarily read these to you or go through them because we don't have that much time. Uh, now, I wanna end my lecture um, using some information that I, I put together for a presentation that I had in class last week. It actually didn't go as well as I thought it was going to. I, I think me and my professor, who's great, by the way, she's, she's a social media expert. The, the course is, we thought it was a marketing course going in, the ones of us, those of us at Fanshawe that are taking it. Um, and it, it's more of a social media marketing course, which is a totally different take on our traditional uh, marketing methods that, that we, we're focusing on in the two-year program here. Uh, so to start this presentation, I created this cheesy little single page site. And what I've done is, see in the middle there, right above the ha ha ha, I created this big huge black space. And I entered way down and I had everybody in the class go to professorsloan.com specifically so that they could see that I was trying to make a point, right? The joke, and it is a bit of a joke, is that without quality content, a website is useless. Now, in the time that I had, I couldn't do anything even close to what I just did with you guys in terms of explaining search engine optimization. And my question actually wasn't to define these things anyway. It was specifically to talk about marketing objectives and how this type of behavior, how this methodology can help achieve marketing objectives. So I set this little thing up and I walked out of the classroom. I thought it was gonna be funnier, but I was like at the end of the presentations, it didn't. I don't know, it was all right. I thought it was pretty cute, but, uh, and then I went to my presentation, okay? And I'll, sh I'll show you this in a second, and this will come up in your links as well. It's, I don't know how the heck I have not seen this before, but this is why I love being back in school, because being back in school keeps you updated. It kind of forces you to go and look for new things. Uh, but I'll start with my presentation. So the question that I was to cover was, let's get this going. How can social publishing, along with SEO and SMO, help to meet marketing objectives? Now, going into this course, I knew what all these things were because I talk about, I've been talking about them in my course for two or three years now. So it, it, I don't, it's not that my professor and I might be on uh, different pages in terms of what they are. I just think I misunderstood the question because I kept focusing on the word how and I kept thinking, okay, so I can't just say, you know, SEO is, is you know, a series of uh, tasks, a, a series of strategies that you can use to get your web page to rank as, as highly as possible on the organic listings, right? I can't just go and define that and say that achieves marketing. That doesn't answer the question. The question was, how does this stuff achieve marketing objectives? So I'm thinking to myself, so I have a... Let's, let's consider, uh, you know, I have a medium-sized uh, corporation based out of uh, KW maybe, and we're supplying various businesses in southwestern Ontario with some sort of computer chips. There's a lot of techie companies in, in KW thanks to BlackBerry, and this is a good thing. Um, and I, I want to market myself. This is B2B, so it's gonna be a little tougher, but there's still gonna be some value in getting this information out there on the web. There's gonna be a lot of businesses that are using this kind of technology that, that might not be aware that I exist. And they're ordering it from other countries. They're maybe ordering it from uh, distributors or maybe other manufacturers that are more expensive than me. I wanna increase my marketing share. That's a marketing objective by a certain percentage. You know, I wanna, I wanna increase my brand recognition within the market of chip technology for, for elevators, let's say it's specific to elevators, for something I'm doing for these buildings. And, and even though B2B is not necessarily as, as well, uh, I guess the, the, the web is not the best venue for B2B when, when you compare it to the way it's worked for consumer markets, but it's still an option. So I got stuck on the word how, just kept thinking about these marketing objectives and 
I thought, okay, I better still define this stuff. So SEO and SMO are two very different things. So SEO, and the easiest way I could do it was, uh, go back, 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 back. Where is my, there. This thing is slow today. Back, back. This didn't happen in the presentation. My Prezi actually worked quite well. Uh, there. People like my site. It's the easiest way to define it. It ranks well. No, it's not technically free, but you're not search engine marketing either. So that's, that's the earned version of your reputation. You're a search engine optimizer by practicing all the stuff we've talked about in this lecture today to better rank your site with the search engines and the organic listings. Then you can go talk about your site, right? In different social media platforms. You can run commercials about your site and videos. Okay, so I'm trying to attract businesses and the managers and the different people within the, it's, it's a tighter market, but I can still do this by optimizing my web content. And that mainly focuses on the website, even though you can also optimize the content that you have in your social media platforms to some degree. I mean, you still can't go into your Facebook profile, for example, and start editing all the HTML properties and going into the code and completely changing the tags so that it's best optimized to, to line up with all the keywords and everything you have in your profile. In fact, most of that's private anyway, unless you set it to be completely public. It's different than a website. So this is where social media optimization comes in because you can't truly optimize the whole back end of most social media platforms. It's more about what you say right on the surface, right in the front. And because you've already optimized your website, this is just an extension of that. You're just creating more awareness it's publicity is what it is. And it's not necessarily publicity if you're paying people to do it for you, which a lot of firms are. Okay, YouTube is massive in this, in this venue and, and Facebook is still the number one thing that a lot of people use to optimize their message in social media because via their Facebook profile, they're talking about like interests with other people that they're friends with and then their business is being mentioned throughout there. Okay, this isn't the same as third party advertising and behavioral retargeting. That's not really social media optimization. It's creating awareness, publicity, sentiment. It's, it's writing about the stuff you've optimized on your website or putting videos up about it in a social media platform. Okay, so when this stuff works, either SEO or SMO, you get engagement, okay? First though, there has to be value. My users have to get something back. And that's what SEO is all about. You're trying to get them to participate and engage. Okay, so when they get something back, it's a result of the engagement. So I just listed a few things that I thought were important related to both of these topics. Okay, and if, if you can come up with something that's hooky enough to go viral, your goal, I mean, you can, you can get more out of a single piece of social media, um, a video, social media, like a post, it's some kind of advice, a single piece of content in social media, then you can uh, from weeks of optimizing your website. It's, it's amazing what you can do, particularly on YouTube. Um, so from there, I got into a little bit of, you know, the, the various platforms that are available to do this. Because once you're done with SEO and you shift to SMO, so you, you gotta have the optimized web platform first. You gotta have your main headquarters, right? Then you shift to SMO. And with SMO, you, you really do need a website. You don't have to have one, but to optimize your message and optimize what you're trying to market and publicize and send to people and products and services, you wanna send them back to a site somewhere. So then I listed this, uh, it was the same thing I showed in your class actually, and there, I, th I find it interesting because there's a bunch of um, social media platforms in there that people haven't even heard of and they're still in the top 10 because the top five are so dominant. Um, and then we shifted over to here to talk about what's working. So, and this is where I got back into social publishing because SEO and SMO are two different things. SEMO is kind of subsequent to SEO because you want to start optimizing in social media once you have an optimized website and you're not dealing with, you're still going to want to think about keyword phrases. You're still going to want to think about how do you, how you add those things into your content when you're talking about things in social media, but think about a YouTube video, right? A YouTube video, 
I mean, well, this is debatable now because Google has done such a good job of uh, using the translating software to transcribe, translating, I say, because it, it will do it in every language for you, every, well, lots of them, to transcribe the audio from YouTube videos so that content can be optimized as well. But it's still not the same as optimizing a website. You're optimizing single items one at a time. Something you say on your Facebook wall, something you've made as a post in a Tumblr blog, something you, you've put into a YouTube video, you're, op you're optimizing things one piece of content at a time. That's the big difference between social media optimization and SEO. And blogging, because it's become a major component as part of the website, that really does start to fuse these two things. Because blogging technically is social media. There's a narrative and there's a storyline, and you're, you're walking your users through this. At the same time, you've optimized a static web platform where the blog is located. So these two things really start to connect, even though they are separate. And I, I'm just trying to make the point that you don't really want to have the one until you have the other. You want to search engine optimize first, then you go to social media optimization. So then that left me with social publishing, which even, even Webopedia doesn't even define. But to me, as I've been discussing this in my class for a couple years now, social publishing kind of goes across both of these things, and it's just, it's, it's specific to content. Social publishing is all about content. Okay, social publishing is not about necessarily improving your rank or improving your visibility or awareness, which is SEO and SMO. It's just strictly about content okay? and, and frequency of content because you're going on and talking about it the same way marketers would typically publish previous to the web. Okay? And this isn't necessarily, I'm, I'm not talking about advertising and running TV commercials. I'm talking about the way marketers would talk about their products and services and journals and try and generate buzz. And they go to trade shows and they do this and that. A lot of people don't even go to trade shows anymore because they can get more out of the web than they can spending all that money to go to Vegas and have a booth and set it all up and all this stuff. So it, this is social publishing. It's the constant creation of content in various platforms that attract the public, that attract the... the the, the social uh, networking of people that are connected to your topics and you're just writing about it all the time. So blogging, obviously, it's, that's, a, that's an example of social publishing, but so is a YouTube channel. So is creating content and just sticking it new on your web page. So if I go, to, if I go all the way back um, to the initial question, right, and this is where I think I sort of stumbled in this presentation. Well, I shouldn't say that. I, I kind of thought I had it right, but this question asked me how can social publishing along with SEO and SMO help to achieve marketing objectives? So I, I've, I've spent a lot less time in my class doing this, but I've tried to define this stuff very quickly because you don't have a lot of time. These presentations are quite brief. And then I got to go back to marketing objectives. So how is this going to do it? Not what is it, right? Because I've done a great job at this point, about 10 minutes in, I thought, of explaining what it is. But how is it going to achieve marketing objectives? So from there, I went to uh, the SMART model. You guys have studied this in, um, has Rhonda covered this? Because you didn't have the, the two-year marketing program. So you aren't marketing students, OK? Have you ever seen this before? Because most of my students in my marketing class, they're at the University of Waterloo. They aren't marketing students either, so they haven't seen this. So I brought this up on the screen, and I'm going through this, and I'm trying to get them to create marketing objectives so I can then turn around and connect the, the processes and the things that you are doing as a result of SEO, SMO, and then social publishing, which are still three separate things, to these objectives. And, and I, was, I just sort of ran out of time, right? Because I had trouble getting people to understand what I was trying to do with the marketing objectives. So how can this, how can these processes, I mean, now, you know, having more time to explain it to you, you guys would probably guess, well, SEO, which is trying to get your site to rank as well as you possibly can in the search engines, that's obviously going to do a good job of making sure that your consumers are well informed. Okay, keeping your consumers are well informed could easily connect to a marketing objective that relates to, um, 
rebuys, right? So people who, so resigns. Like if you're in sales and you wanna get people to continue to use you, but every year they need to buy more stuff, search engine optimization will keep them at the top of mind. And that could connect to a marketing objective that I want to make sure that in addition to having new accounts, I turn back over 90% of my existing accounts. That's a marketing objective within the next calendar year. Okay, SEO could help to achieve that. Social media optimization can help to achieve a marketing objective that relates to brand awareness. You know, in, in, in the consumer polls that we did last year, only three out of 10 consumers were even aware of the name of the company that was creating the product that we're making for their elevator, this computer chip. That's very bad brand awareness. They're buying this thing, they don't even know who you are. I actually make a bunch of other stuff that they might be able to use. And if I could introduce them to the entire family of products that I have underneath this brand, and increase brand awareness, that could really help achieve an increase in sales for a marketing objective. So SMO then, if you make a marketing objective that in the new consumer poll, 365 days from now, I want at least seven out of 10 consumers to know the name of my brand and understand what we make. That's a specific marketing objective that social media optimization could actually help to achieve. And that's how it would do that because you'd, you'd be going through the process of creating awareness and creating additional pu publicity, just telling people about it. And this is why I kept going back to content and I was focusing on content, 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 which is like the entire first hour of our class today. Because that's, that's a lot of what SEO is about. And then, and then I'm left with social publishing because the question addresses three different things and how they might achieve, help achieve marketing objectives, right? So social publishing as sort of not really, it's, it's corollary to these two things, but it's sort of, it's sort of what comes afterwards. You, you've already optimized your site. You're practicing social media optimization. So once you get that, those down pat, just sort of continuously going in and talking about this stuff, like it, the ongoing process of just doing it would be considered social publishing. And at that point in my presentation, I'm like, how is that really that much different from social media optimization? Because social media optimization, unlike search engine optimization, which is more about your organic rank, social media optimization is more about awareness and sentiment, which is a very important word, because that could be a marketing objective to increase the, the likeness of your brand, right? Everybody knows about your brand, but right now they all hate it because of some stupid news story that involved like this union dispute and it's, it really wasn't your fault and you need to change that perception. That's where social media optimization would come into play, but isn't social publishing just like that because it, it's just continuously updating on the topic you're already trying to optimize. So that's what I remembered YouTube. Right? Because YouTube is a little bit different. YouTube is a bunch of one-off. I mean, they're usually running along the same sort of storyline, but they're one-off narratives. They're one-off little, little bits and pieces of information that can then somehow connect you back. So these viral videos that you see for advertising and marketing, a lot of times they have hardly anything to do with the product until the very, very end. And it was the entertainment value alone then that sends people back to that product. Okay, and just having that product mentioned there at the end, I mean, that's, that's really social media optimization. Whereas social publishing would be very, very openly continuing to talk about the product. It would be a lot less subtle. And it would happen on your website and in your social media platforms. It would happen across both. And I understood this going in, but when I got to here and realized that I was probably bringing in a topic that, that a lot of my fellow students were yet to really grasp or get. I, I just, it, I think it was just overwhelming. Um, so with you guys, I just, I wanted to give you the same presentation because when I made it, I'm like, oh, this is perfect. I can throw that in at the end of my lecture next, next week to explain these things rather than just define them like I always do. Because I usually define SEO and SMO, which are both defined on Webopedia. And then for social publishing, I have to search what is social publishing to give you some sort of tangible definition that's online. Okay, so you can see right here what it's talking about. It's the blend of categories. That's what they say. Okay, they also talk about fireworks, web app fireworks, or frameworks, sorry, frameworks. They're not talking about um, 
like specific versions of frameworks like Bootstrap is a framework for uh, WordPress, okay? It helps you edit your CSS. I, I think what they should have used is the word platform and just left it at that because I still, if I go and search for definitions of this, each one of them will be different. So what it really comes down to is the fact that you have web content, you have social content, you might have applications. It's the co collection of all this stuff and the constant process of trying to make sure that people know what's going on. Okay, through through these platforms, because a, even a website now is is more and more becoming considered a social piece of marketing, a, a social marketing tool. Because even on a website, you can allow users to participate. It doesn't have to be a social platform. Look at Amazon and look at the uh, look at the product reviews they have there. So my answer to this was that you know for sure it can affect, it can help achieve marketing objectives but the question was how and what it, and, and it, i mean as a i don't mean to sound redundant but as an overall answer it, it it just keeps going back to content and communication because even though each of these three things by definition are a little bit different they all rely on content so when i got to the end i started with the word yes because Yes, it can help achieve marketing objectives, but the question was how, and I knew that, but I was, I was turning it around because the, the word how is, it, it made it tough to fit it into 15 minutes. It was, it, I had a hard go at it, and um, you know, props to my teacher for giving, well, she can give me that challenge. I, I kind of walked up late and I was stuck with that question. Nobody else took it, it was weird. Um, but yeah, I didn't have time to have the discussion with them. I didn't have time to get into the fact that one of the other ways that this type of marketing activity, and this, this relates to all three of them, SEO, SMO, and uh, social publishing, one of the ways it can help achieve marketing objectives because a lot of marketing objectives are, are directly connected to numbers. They're very quantifiable. They're very number-based. The data, the richness of the data that you can get just through the analytics platform that you guys are learning to use right now, and that's another plugin you're going to want on your WordPress sites that I'll talk about tomorrow, is the GA plugin. You get direct and quantifiable data for free to determine what's really going on and, and the results of this, this behavior. So when you're posting things, for example, and it's hard in social media platforms because with social media platforms, they're not as directly optimized and trackable as a website. YouTube is becoming more so, much more so, and I'll show you that here at the end, but uh, they have tools to get around this, like social mention. Has anybody ever heard of social mention? Okay, that's gonna be in a, two people. All right, it's gonna be another link in your FOL for this week. Social mention is 100% free, and based on a keyword phrase, it will give you like the, a full analysis of how people are um, discussing this in what sort of uh, tone are they discussing it like is it happy is it sad is it angry it's really neat and you don't even need to set up an account to use it so if uh, Bitcoin that's a good one people were really raging about that last year and I don't think they've been too happy about it since then so if I search for the instance of uh, let's just search Bitcoin let's just search the brand name period and I'm going to go across all platforms because you can go through blogs, microblogs. It covers Facebook and it covers YouTube. And we're because what are people doing in YouTube after they watch a video, right? Now, and that's not social publishing. That's just their participation. That's the fifth P. They're engaging in the narrative for this product or brand. They're commenting and they're giving thumbs up and thumbs down. Okay, all this stuff is going on that is providing you as the user with extremely rich data to help determine whether or not the marketing objectives of these, of these processes of SEO, SMO, and social publishing are actually being met. So how can they help them be met? This data is, is going to help a ton, okay? You get the qualitative stuff and the quantitative stuff because you get the people giving you like paragraphs of comments about something and you also get data like the thumbs up, thumbs down on a YouTube video. You get both at the same time. Okay, so, and then I was gonna end with like, um, 
what about the time you have to spend on this, particularly SMO, because it takes so much time beyond SEO, which is still an ongoing process, but to be in these various social media platforms, posting videos, making references to products, like working the living crap out of your Facebook profile that you have for this service or product, this takes a lot of time. And Social Examiner, which was the resource I used to pull some of this data, they, they have a, an annual report that actually discusses these things like how much time people are actually spending on SMO versus the time they originally had to spend on SEO and how it's not even relative anymore. It's like dramatically more. So it, it's, it's really debatable to say this is like free publicity because it, it's far from it if you count the labor hours. So in that sense, I, I would say that you really need to factor that in at the end to determine whether or not it, it did help achieve, you that, achieve that marketing objective because if you achieved a marketing objective of increasing brand awareness, which then led to an increase in sales of X percent that year, but the increase in sales only provided you with X amount of dollars, which turned out to be less than the money you spent trying to do it, you gotta be careful with this. Like, people think it's all free. And when you get into social publishing and social media optimization, so, social, so optimizing your presence and awareness and sentiment in the various platforms and then publishing, just generally talking and writing about it everywhere you can, including back on your website, this is not free, okay? It takes time. And the social examiner goes through the different platforms and how much time people are actually spending on this and then it talks about the ones that are now providing the best bang for your buck in terms of labor hours, and it always goes back to YouTube. Um, so we can use things like this as well to give us some quality data, but like a YouTube video, the statistics you get just from one video, it's unbelievable, okay? Where people came from that watched it, how long they watched it for, what they said about it, thumbs up or thumbs down, all the participation stuff, all sorts of things just from that one video. So that, getting that right off the top and, and being able to get so much of a reaction out of single pieces of content might help alleviate the issue that you have here when you talk about how much time you can spend on SMO and how that might then take away from that marketing objective you thought you achieved. It's, and I just, guys, to get that out in the class time that I had was nearly impossible. And I'm, I'm upset because I'm... I'm used to getting all A's and I didn't get an A because I, I should have better organized it. I, I'd prepared it ahead of time, but I, you know, I should have practiced, practiced it over and over again so I knew I could fit it in there. It was just too much because these topics are, I mean, they are overwhelming the amount of time you can spend doing these things. It, it's just insane. So that's why I recommend tools like this, okay? It helps you understand if you're getting anything back out of this. Like a tool like Social Mention will give you legitimate information about how people are talking about this. And if you sit on each of these, it says reach is the measure of the range of influence. So the number of unique authors. So is it going up, is it going down? Are less people talking about Bitcoin? That's not a good thing, okay? Even when more people were talking about it after that Mt. Gox thing last year, when I don't know, did anybody own Bitcoins in here, anybody? Okay, you're probably lucky that you didn't. Um, because they went, it was like this massive, massive drop. And if you bought into Bitcoin any time in the previous eight months to that drop, you were completely screwed. Um, so tons of people were talking about it, but that didn't mean that didn't help their market share then when it had dropped down so much. And a lot of savvy investors will realize that something like this is, is a, representing a trend that is not going away. So once all the negative media from this scammer guy that had, had totally screwed up the, the stock, stock price, it's the, the, the figure price, the, the money price of the coin, it's going to go back up again. Okay, so there were more people talking about it, and that was a good thing. Um, I think when I, when I did my, I did a project on it last year, this was at like 70%. It was insane. Okay, so for example, if you have a small group of very passionate advocates who talk about your products or brand at the same time, uh, you have a higher, so the passion score is not so great now. It used to be like in the 50s until this thing, until this scandal happened last year. Sentiment is the ratio of mentions that are generally positive to those that are generally negative. So this isn't too bad. This was terrible last year, but even though less people are talking about it and less people are passionate about it, most of what people are saying this, like almost a year ago, 
most of, uh, I guess February, it's like whatever, 10 months, eight, nine months, is generally positive now. And then the strength is the likelihood that your brand is being discussed. So this is, this is still really high. People are still talking about it in general. So, and you can go further and get more data, like look at all this stuff. It talks about which platforms they're using it on, where they're talking about it. Um, obviously Twitter is a key player in this because tweets um, will make mention of things uh, very often and frequently. The frequency of tweets is really good. But it's still, I wanna, if I go back here, that still takes a lot of time. And crafting a good tweet, I mean, you can't be like, uh, oh, who's married to Kardashian again? Come on. Kanye, Kanye yeah. Like, there's, there's some controversy right now about her, um, about the butt shot she has in the front of that magazine, right? Which is awesome publicity. Like, everybody's going to go Google it. Everybody's going to want to get a copy of it. And, you know, I don't know if it's a hard print or whatever. And Kanye tweets, which has become part of the news story and the narrative for this. Kanye tweet, his tweet was just all day. That was it. That was his tweet. I mean... To come up with something that, like, somebody told him to do that. Like, he's probably got advisors that spent, like, six hours trying to figure out how we should respond to the negativity around his wife's butt on the cover of a magazine, and he responds all day. I mean, it's just brilliant, because that, that's, that alone is going to generate more buzz and more hype about the story, which, at the end of the day, that's all Kardashian is about, right? It's just, it's nothing. It's just her and her personal life. I mean, it's, it's quite a phenomenon. It's, it's really interesting. And stuff like the web, stuff like I've been talking about in this lecture here, it, it directly correlates to, to phenomenons like that. Now, I want to end with YouTube today. YouTube is a whole different animal. And one of the stats that I had in my presentation there talked about, this is really interesting. So people who get into social media optimization, and they've just started on it. They just, got, they just got on board on this bandwagon last year. What's their number one go-to platform to go and tell everybody about their stuff? What is it? You know what it is. You're on there all the time. What is it? Facebook. People that have been doing this for a much longer period of time, people that have been doing this for five years, their number one has flipped. Their number one is YouTube. Okay, and this I learned, and I want to credit these, uh, these stats. This I learned here, which is also going to be in your notes for this week. And this, I mean, as far as I can tell, there's a, sorry, social media examiner. It's linked from my Professor Sloan page, actually. As far as I can tell, there is no fee, even for their podcasts. And I think these guys are uh, the driving force behind a few, like, massive trade events and shows and there's the social media marketing world and in San Diego I think this is a special event and you gotta pay a lot of money I think this is where they make the majority of their money is through events like this so they publish and research and do all this data and provide it to free for, for businesses and entrepreneurs and it guys it is unbelievable how rich this data is like I could, this is why I hate making comments like this to you but you know if I wasn't teaching this course and also in school I could probably make a killing marketing whatever I was marketing and doing what I was doing just just from learning how to do it properly using resources like this using YouTube you can go back to school on YouTube and learn how to make a WordPress site you didn't need my course to do that but my course and the other courses with it will provide you with a diploma which is a certificate I guess you guys are a certificate program but this is an awesome resource this is where I found a lot of this stuff and this is the resource that told me that these guys that have been doing this for a while are going back to number one with YouTube. I'm not going to show you all the stats and the data and the, that kind of stuff. If you, anytime you upload a video, you go to statistics, you can see all that, all that data per each video. And you can also see it per channel. So what I have done uh, relative to my fan show works, I've set up a YouTube channel and it's primarily educational based. And then I have different playlists within the channel. Two that focus on Excel, a couple that focus on web stuff. I now have a WordPress playlist that, that, uh, that's now come up with my standard HTML playlist and all the previous videos I had for this course. And lots of people watch these. It's a big educational spin on YouTube right now. But there's other things that are going on. So there's a phenomenon uh, that I refer to as just insane, we'll call it, but there's YouTubers. Okay, now some of these I really, really like. 
There are YouTubers that there's a there's one YouTuber and I keep forgetting who it is. I, they post like once a month a video of somebody doing something completely insane, and it's not necessarily extreme sports, but just an athlete doing something that you just don't believe. And and I, I see a lot of entertainment value there, and I I really dig this kind of stuff. And these videos will be well well into the millions within the first day or two. Okay, this guy is very similar. So in terms of uh, activity. He's not similar in terms of content. But what he has done is he's created like an overall narrative, which is, uh, I don't know, moronic, like just nonsense, like idiocy, whatever you want to call it. And he has uh, uh, 30 some million subscribers a video that he will have posted less than a day ago. Okay, here, 23 hours ago. 1,579,000 views. Uh, now, what's that song that's out right now? Uh, something about the bass? What's her name? Megan what? What is her name? Megan Trainer. yeah. Uh, she has, so, so, I mean, this is an extremely... Um, impressive skill, believe it or not, because we're going to watch a bit of that PewDiePie video. Then. Uh, 253 million, okay, so this is, you know, this is over five months. But this demonstrates some traction that these YouTubers won't necessarily get without Hollywood behind them. So it's not like I'm saying nobody can match what the YouTuber does. I mean, what did, what did Miley end up getting on Wrecking Ball? I never did. Miley on Wrecking Ball has 720, right, in a year. But if you go to PewDiePie, okay, and you go to, let's go to his, uh, his channel. Okay, so a YouTube channel, and I doubt this guy has a website. You know, I've never even bothered to look. So he's optimizing content in social media without even having SEO. But technically, each video is optimized itself with SEO. So these are most of his recent ones. Um, yeah, okay, yeah. I don't know. I mean, he's got a couple, oops. He's got a couple up there at the top, like almost 60 million. Like, that's pretty good. I mean, that's pushing Hollywood out of the way, like for most people. I mean, most... Uh, and, and I know they're rock stars, but I still consider it all Hollywood. Like, like that trainer video and the Miley video, I mean, that's, that's Hollywood. And that's a, that's a bit exceptional. Like, most of these new singles that come out from artists like that do not get those kind of views. So if we were to just take a peek, I'm just going to randomly pick any of these. Like, here's one that was posted in the last month, and it's already up to three and a half million. Okay, let's see what he's got going on here. Okay, he's going to have ads, and they're either going to be rolling through or running off the top, because what he probably does uh, for a living is this, okay? And he probably makes, I don't know, 30 grand a year, uh, sorry, 30 grand a month doing this stuff, just from 30 grand a year, at least 30 grand a month, just, just from people clicking on his ads. Um, so, and I've got absolutely no volume because I've got my mic running. Uh, this is going to be kind of hard to do because I've got my mic running right now, but... And it's not going to come through the video either. So if you're watching the video, just I'd ask that you guys go and look for some of this because I forgot to record system audio. But the point is, his videos, they're, they're literally, most of them have to do with gaming. So he does have a bit of an overall theme of gaming. But most of his videos are just him doing dumb stuff. Him talking to his dog. Three and a half million views. Oh, I got to see PewDiePie talking to his dog. There's no particular reason why this is like this. Nobody can explain it. He just, he had something about it. It was hooky. He has virality, okay? This one drives me nuts. If you've ever watched any of her videos, and we're not going to watch one. Jenna Marbles is another YouTuber. She probably, she has a lot of product placement in her videos. She does quite well. Like, she makes easy 30 grand a month doing this. And she's not even 20. Like, I, I think she might even still, I think she's 18 now, but really phenomenal i mean and just the weirdest stuff like how to wear a bra how to put on makeup the right way 
here's a stupid thing that happened to me at a dance. Like, it, like that'll be a video. Two weeks ago, two million views. I mean, that's pretty good. That's pretty impressive. How, here's another one. Here's another good one. And these, these, this is an example of, it, this is optimized social media content. So it's social media optimization because you're, you're, you're continuously trying to run like a narrative. You're in there. You're talking about this stuff. But this is also social publishing because you're just on an ongoing basis just posting, posting, posting. Content, content, content. It's video, but it's still social publishing. Um, and it's optimized because she has a channel. The channel has a theme. She's, she's connecting to other people and creating awareness and creating sentiment for her brand, which is Jenna Marbles. That's the difference. These are, these are all three different things that were part of my question there. Um, so another good one, and there are people that have, a lot of people that have channels like this. Um, let's do this one. Do you, uh, here, wait, this is even better. These videos of adults unpackaging toys. Do you guys know about this? I have, I have a daughter, so the fact that a video of somebody unwrapping 60 surprise eggs that is uh, 35 minutes long almost, has 73 million views. What is going on here? And you don't think this is about business and marketing and that something in the background here is being, I mean, obviously Kinder's gonna like this, but the person that's doing this, their business model is not about selling toys. Their business model is about promoting their narrative and their content in YouTube, they probably have a blog that came after this. They probably have a website somewhere, but they make their money by driving traffic to these videos. So when I click on a video like this, okay, here's what's interesting. And here's where I think this is borderline unethical. I hand my daughter this phone, okay? I hand her my smartphone. My daughter has learned now, she's three years old, but everybody's all, oh, my kid's so smart. My daughter is unusually, um, uh, skilled with using technology and just figuring things out and reading emotions and humans and my son's a little different. My son's just like, let's trash the basement. I'll have it done in five minutes. It'll be completely screwed. It'll take you three hours to clean it. My daughter, she's here. She's figured out. I can just click on this and I'll just click a few times and then it'll skip and go, go right to the video. My son, who's now comfortable with YouTube, just puts his fingers all over the video at the beginning there, right? So he's gonna click on the ad and load up the ad. So these ads are served up, here watch. And it should run another ad if I refresh. These ads are served up to me at the beginning of the video. There's also ads that roll through videos a lot. Okay, I have these ads in my videos. Okay, this is not social media optimization. This is not social publishing. This is third party advertising for other random stuff that doesn't relate at all to this video. Why is Bathfitter advertising here? Because they assume that parents will probably be, you, you pick and choose, you don't pick and choose the exact videos you're in, but you pick and choose general genres of videos that you can have your ads served up in. But the problem is, if my son's watching this, he's going to click on the ad. Now, I will not do that in class, nor will I ever, because it, this is not okay. It's, it's not ethical. It's, if I click on that ad, bath fitter, and I think these guys are kind of cute. They got those funny commercials about the, the husband and wife always get on and they... <laughs> It's kind of awkward because they know they're being recorded. And if I click on that ad, they pay uh, in a video like this with 70,000, se oh, sorry, 70,000, 70 some million views. They've probably bid a couple bucks to be, to be running at the beginning of that video. They won't pay a dime if nobody clicks on it. Okay, this is how, this is how the sponsor links work too. But they will pay if I click on it here. So a kid watching a video with a bunch of toys in it, he's gonna be banging on the thing like crazy. And they're going to, to have their videos, uh, their video, because this is a video commercial, to have their commercials running in those kinds of videos, they're probably spending a lot of extra money each month just because kids are banging on the screen. This is pretty crazy, the stuff that's going on here. And the money that this person's making off this video for advertising is probably doing nothing because of the viewers of the video. Now, I got to tell you guys, if this advertising overall did nothing, we wouldn't have people uh, jumping on board and running AdSense and running these ads and videos like, like thousands of them by the day. I mean, it works. It does work. But I think it would be a bit suspect in a video like this.
where the kid is not going to know to click right there. The kid is going to touch that screen and click on that ad. And Backfender is going to pay for it. And this thing with the unwrapping of toys, Play-Doh, search Play-Doh. You wouldn't believe it. It's freaking insane what's going on on YouTube. Okay, and I don't even know what to call this. Is it social media optimization? Is it really trying to create awareness and drive traffic specific to the product of Play-Doh? When some lady that started a Play-Doh channel that doesn't even have kids, she's a really good one too. She, I don't know if she couldn't have kids or what it is, but she does these Play-Doh videos and they're so fun. They're like she, she does the voices and she's doing all this stuff. She makes money because she's entertaining kids with the toys. But the brand at the same time is receiving a kickback from her so from her optimizing she's social publishing her content which is just here's me playing with toys and the process of her optimizing it is by going in and putting all the right keywords and all the tags and everything i'll show you in a video how you can do that here um, this was a long lecture guys i know but it was important we're almost done uh, this is where the whole social publishing versus optimizing your content for search engine optimization or social media is not the same because her ongoing posting of these videos that are just generic to playing with toy videos, that's social publishing. Okay, her uh, efforts to create awareness of her channel and her overall narrative and her theme, to me, I mean, everybody's defining these things differently these days, but that's SMO, that's social media optimization, and that's what's making her money. But at the same time, Plato as a brand, as, a, as Hasbro, I think Plato. Um, don't quote me on that. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I'm not a toy expert. But the company that makes Plato, they're reaping the benefits of her optimizing her videos to make money off just the views, because people are then finding those videos, and parents are going out and buying more Plato because their kids can't get enough of the videos. It's it's crazy what's going on here. So when this stuff starts to happen. Companies catch on to that, and they will send these people free toys by the box load to put in their videos. What the hell is that? Is that social media optimization? Is that social publishing? Is that certain? I don't even know what that is. So it's hard to really put your finger on these topics and how they can help achieve marketing objectives, going back to my question. But what I can tell you is that because the data is there, and it's, I already closed my Prezi. Um, because the data is there and it's so rich and easy to get that if you have quantitative specific marketing objectives, it's hard not to argue that you can market using the web and then connect the results of that back to that objective. So that was the point I was trying to make. And how long did it take me to do that? Like over half an hour? I mean, it wasn't easy, but I did. I, I put some time into the lecture because I wanted it to be for your class as well. Um, okay, so... What did we learn today? Uh, wait, there was one last. Uh, there was one last thing. My YouTube videos. I'm not logged in. Um, I'll show you that tomorrow. There's a. I'll show you how you can put the tags in the description. All the all the standard stuff you do for optimizing a website, you can do individually to a video. So we learned today that you just spent ten weeks of a course learning how to make a website, and the last three weeks of the course that I think are easily as important. Uh, you know might take you twice as long. I mean, you're not going to, okay, you're not going to take 10 weeks to make a website now. You took 10 weeks to learn how to make one in a day. You can do that. But optimizing your site is more important. And then getting into social media platforms and continuing to tell the story, okay, in various platforms and trying to connect that back to your brand, to your service, and creating more awareness and improving your sentiment and just having that kind of publicity, that's social media optimization. And then in either platform, on your website, in social media platforms, anywhere on the web where you're just, for an ongoing period of time, just talking about the same thing over and over again, that's social publishing. So it, it's, it's, they're all part of you know, the web marketing engine. And I just don't want you guys as marketing students to think you took a web design course with me and that's where it ends. Okay, a, like I'm talking a big chunk of your project that I'll review with you tomorrow is going to go specifically toward this SEO stuff and past that because you're not launching your site. I can't really grade you on SMO. 
But I would like to see, even for those of you that are doing fictional sites, some posting, some information about this, some information about the topics. Um, here's what's new in our store. Here's something I just, you could even do this with a resume website. I mean, I could go on and on about examples, but we gotta, we gotta cut it off here. Um, so tomorrow will be a much, much shorter lecture with lots of lab time. Uh, and I need you guys to be on time because right off the top we're installing two plugins and then I'm going to show you how they work. So I, if you walk in 10 minutes late, I mean, just try and be on time tomorrow, okay? I'll see you then.